So I'd like to, on behalf of the students, staff, and faculty of the Institute, I'd like to welcome all of you to our Foundation Day celebrations. Uh, our foundation Uh, as many of you may know, we were founded in 1959 and then we became an IIT in 1961. And I think it is very appropriate that in the Foundation Day lecture, the 65th Foundation Day, we have one of our own, our alumnus, um, Professor Pavan Sina, giving the talk. Uh, Foundation Day is a time where we can take stock of what we have done, what we have achieved, what we need to do. And there are many interesting things and it's very interesting that on this Foundation Day, well, near about the Foundation Day, we are, the new campus in Abu Dhabi has been operationalized and the first batch uh, on the master's program is going to be on the campus on the 29th. It's very similar to 27th. So I think it's another foundation that we have. We have, as you all know, we have an, an, a campus in Sonipat and we are planning a campus in Jhajjar. There are lots of things to be done, but we should uh, look at the foundation as a day on which we rededicate ourselves to our goals of excellence in teaching, research, and in impact, um, and seeing that our research and our education makes an impact in society. We want, as per our vision, we want to be the pride of all Indians, and this is something that uh, we need to work towards. Uh, so I'd uh, like to extend a special welcome to Professor Pavan Sina, and look forward to his Foundation Day lecture. Um, so with these few words, I'll hand it over back to Subod. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Banerjee. Uh, before we um, uh, get started with the Institute lecture, uh, as has been the custom, uh, we um, give uh, faculty awards, research awards uh, on this day. So I invite uh, Professor Krishna, who's Dean Faculty, um, on the stage to talk about it. Well, it's actually customary to hand over the awards on Foundation Day, but this year we, we are doing it slightly differently. Uh, what we are doing today is announcing the awards, and we will have a separate occasion where we will hand over the awards and also give the award winners an opportunity to present in previous years. Uh, so without further ado, so this is uh, Faculty Research Awards for 2023. Uh, we have four categories of awards. The first one is an early career award. Uh, there are two categories called Basic Research Award and Applied Research Award. And then there's a Lifetime Award for research contributions. So I'm going to start with the, uh, the recommendations of the standing committee for these awards. The final signatures will happen, and uh, these will be the names that will be um, awarded. So for the Earlier Career Award, we have Professor Anup Krishnan from Civil Engineering, Prof Professor Arnab Chanda from CBME, the Bio Center for Biomedical Engineering, Professor Prabhu Babu at the Center for Applied Research in Electronics, and so Professor Supreet Singh Bhaga of Mechanical Engineering. These are the four Early Career Award winners. Uh, congratulations to all four of you. In the basic research award category. We have Professor 
Sundar of DBEP, the Department of Biochemical and, uh, Engineering and Biotechnology, and Professor Manav Bhatnagar from the Electrical Engineering Department. Congratulations to... <laughs> and in the Applied Research category, we have Professor Swadesh De and Professor D.S. Mehta, uh, Professor Swadesh De of Electrical and Mehta of Physics Department. Congratulations. <laughs> In the category of Lifetime Achievement Award, uh, this year's uh, award goes to Professor Neeraj Khare of the Physics Department. And uh, congratulations to all of the awardees, and also our thanks to the alumni and other donors who've instituted these awards. Uh, we will circulate an email in the next few weeks uh, scheduling an event where uh, all of these award winners can present their work and be felicitated properly. Thank you. Um, I invite uh, Professor Narayanan Kurur, our, our Dean Academics, to introduce Professor Sinha. Good evening. <clears throat> professor Pawan Sina is a professor of vision and computational neuroscience in the Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences at the MIT. He's been there since 1989, I believe. Um, he graduated uh, with a BTEC in computer science and engineering from this institute in 1988 the third graduating batch of undergraduate BTEC degrees from here. Uh, and then he uh, had a crash landing on his trip to the US to take up higher studies at University of California, Berkeley. And the Hindu, a clipping which he has on his uh, website says, he was interviewed by the Hindu about the, the crash landing and there are a few uh, sentences attributed to him. Um, but the crash landing didn't affect him uh, adversely, it appears. Um, uh, yeah. Well, no, no, he claims that it, there is no vestige of, uh, of that. He is proof for that, scientific proof. Um, and then he was trying to do a, a high performance CPU at Berkeley, which he said improving the efficiency of VLSI um, was a drudgery. And he happened to attend a class taught by Dan Glazer, who was a Nobel laureate in cosmic rays, but about vision, which then got him to move after a year to the uh, School of the Department of Computer Science at MIT, where he got his master's and his PhD. Uh, his interest in vision, he claims, is from his initial days of doing art, uh, motivated by his sister. And uh, the portraits were apparently some things that interested him. And he had two portraits, one of Leonid Brezhnev and the Queen Elizabeth, which he sent to uh, Moscow and uh, to UK. And he got a set of books by mere publishers from Leonid Brezhnev and a nice letter from the Queen of England. Um, he, well, now he's, he'll talk to us today about uh, Project Prakash, where he combines um, science and service uh, in a talk which is called India's Karma Bhumi for Science and Service. Professor Pawansina, I should also add, um, yes, closer to home. Uh, he is, uh, he was a resident of Jualamukhi, like uh, hostel, uh, like uh, both the DDS, both DDSP and DDO who have had some association with Jualamukhi hostel in different capacities. Professor Pawan Sina. <clears throat> <clears throat> uh, 
that was the most revealing introduction I've ever had. <coughs> I'll be able to. Okay. So, sorry, I don't have a regular USB connector. So it's okay. It's this good. So, Professor Narayanan, thank you very much for that amazing introduction. I don't know where you got, got all that information from, <laughs> but all of that was true. And I'm going to rehash some of that here. Um, so, to be called upon to be part of the foundation day of IIT Delhi is really deeply, deeply significant for me. Because IIT Delhi has had such foundational significance for my life. And that influence began very early, close to birth. So at the age of two months, I moved to, to uh, IIT. I was born in a hospital in Kanpur, because that's where my maternal grandfather used to work as a doctor. But my father was already working at IIT Delhi in the establishment one section. So he was a long time IITian, um, and our family just always lived on the IIT campus. So some of you might recognize this spot. This is the nursery. Um, so I'm about a year old in this picture. And the institute is about six years old uh, at this time. So this is 1967. If we fast forward about 19 years, here is a picture that I hesitate to show, but this is me <laughs> about to graduate from IIT Delhi. So it was almost inevitable that I would go to IIT Delhi. Uh, I had gone to school at the Kendri Vidyalay then took a little detour to DPS Archipuram, and then came back to be uh, in CS at, uh, out here. Um, around the time of graduating, I was fortunate to get an offer of admission from UC Berkeley. And because my undergraduate thesis had been in the area of high performance computing, under Professor B.B. Madan, with whom I just recently reestablished connection. He's in the old Dominion uh, University in the US. Um, so I thought that my life's work lies in high performance computing. And because Berkeley was the acknowledged world leader in that area, I decided to go to Berkeley. But as Professor Narayan and so, <laughs> aptly pointed out, that first journey did not go as planned. So my father had purchased a ticket on what was at that time the highest rated airline, Air France. So I got Air France 747. And right after takeoff, one of the engines burst into flames, the plane crashed, In, in the next day. Um, at the time all of this was happening, this was my very first air flight. I had no idea what all the jarring and loud sounds are. I quite literally, completely honestly, I quite literally thought that the likelihood of my being in a plane crash on my very first flight is so small that this is probably just the extension of the emergency drill that the stewardesses were going through. So I was very calm uh, throughout, <laughs> throughout the entire process. It was only later that we realized the, the magnitude of the disaster. But this story actually has a nice ending. So Air France, to make up for the inconvenience that the passengers had suffered, they put the two of us who were proceeding on to the US onto not just any flight, but on the Concorde. So we covered the Paris to New York leg on the Concorde. Flying at 69,000 feet, you can in fact see the curvature of the Earth below you. So anyway, eventually I 
got to Berkeley, uh, a really nice campus, and I was put to work by my assigned advisor, uh, Professor David Patterson, who came up with the idea of risk architectures, reduced instruction set computer architectures. He wanted me to, to optimize some aspects of the, of the chip design to make the square root operation about 10% faster. That was the PhD question. And I knew that I could do that problem, but my heart seemed not to be in it. And I got very fortunate that Professor Don Glazer, that uh, Professor Narayan just mentioned, he happened to be offering a course in vision on brain science. And I just completely fell in love with neuro neuroscience and neurobiology. And I thought that this is the field that I want to go in without completely giving up on the training that I had received at IIT Delhi. So I wanted to combine my background in computer science with my newfound love for neuroscience. So I wanted to work in the area of computational neuroscience. Berkeley at that time did not have a very strong program in computational neuroscience. MIT did. And the previous year, I had turned down MIT to go to Berkeley. So now it was time for me to write a very apologetic letter <laughs> to MIT. And out of the goodness of their heart, they accepted, uh, accepted me to come to MIT after a, a year of starting at Berkeley. So I moved to MIT. Here is the beautiful institute, the main building of, of MIT. And here, my exposure. So even though I was still in the computer science department at MIT, I was being introduced to lots of material in neuroscience and specifically visual neuroscience that MIT had really very strong uh, presence in. So my interests became a little more focused in vision. So understanding what are the mechanisms by which we make sense of the complex visual inf information that the eyes provide, uh, provide us. Um, I did my PhD in computational vision. This is my PhD advisor, uh, Professor Tommaso Poggio. And uh, soon thereafter, after a, a couple of years of postdoctoral work, I was fortunate to get uh, the offer of a faculty position um, <clears throat> in the Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences. And as I started my faculty position, I found my interest sharpening even further beyond just vision to the issue of the development of vision. Not just how do we possess this amazing machinery, this amazing expertise at interpreting visual information, but how do we come to acquire these skills? That seemed to me like the holy grail question of, of neuroscience. Um, and the, the question that really motivated me is well captured by this famous quote from William James, who was often considered the father of American psychology. So William James, writing over 100 years ago, described the sensory world of a newborn this way. The baby, assailed by eyes, ears, nose, skin, and entrails at once, feels it all as one great blooming, buzzing confusion. So we start out our lives with this complex sensory chaos, and the amazing thing that the brain does is it very quickly brings this chaos under control, and we begin to make sense of the sensory environment. That process is fascinating to me, and it's fascinating to hundreds of neuroscientists across the world. How does the brain learn to do this? How do we accomplish this transformation over the course of development? <clears throat> so because this is a developmental question, we might be constrained, or uh, the only possible way for us as experimentalists to probe this question would be to work with newborns, those who are actually going through this developmental transformation, whether these are human newborns or non-human newborns. 
our hope would be to study the developmental processes in such uh, creatures. But because newborns are so difficult to work with, we tend to wait for at least a few months before the babies, whether human or non-human, are able to, to comply with the experimental demands that we are making of them. But that strategy of waiting, even by, say, seven or eight months, to get started with our experiments turns out to be a non-starter for the specific case of visual development, as this schematic of the developmental timelines uh, makes clear. So these are the timelines of development across a few different dimensions. And you notice at the very top is visual development. And you notice how short the bar is there. So within a a baby is already developing into a very proficient visual observer of the world. So if you have waited to start your studies until seven or eight months, then you have missed the, missed the bus. The baby has already acquired most of the milestones that you would have wanted to study as an experimenter. So that brings us back to the question that we, we started out with. How do we understand the very initial stages of this transformation from a blooming, buzzing confusion to an organized sensorium? <clears throat> and this is where the title for today's lecture becomes relevant, because India provided the answer to this question. How do we make headway on this, on this issue? India turned out to be the karmbhumi for science. And it's a word that I don't often use, but in this context, it seems to be particularly germane. This was the place that allowed us uh, the action that was needed in order to make some advancements on the scientific question that we were interested in. But not only did India provide an opportunity for advancing along the scientific dimension, but also along the service dimension. This was just a beautiful coming together of two threads. <clears throat> and that's the, the brief story that I want to tell you about as to what this project is that allows us, uh, the research group that I'm privileged to work with, and some of them are present here, uh, that allows us to make advancements on both the service and the scientific aspects. <clears throat> and I hope that the message that you will take away, the broad message, is that you, India is perhaps unique in providing these kinds of opportunities. This project would be very hard to do almost anywhere else in the world um, with the speed and the, and the service that we have been able to do here. <clears throat> so to give you some background to this work, this is a statistic that really startled me. I was unaware of the magnitude of the problem of blindness in, in our country. About one in every 160 Indians is blind. This is across all ages. Even if you confine your attention to just children, the picture doesn't get much rosier. The incidence of childhood blindness, so children being born blind per, say, 1,000 live births, that incidence is about three times as high in India as it is in the West. The various kinds of factors that lead to this high incidence uh, elevated, uh, this elevated incidence of corneal scarring of children being born with cataracts. So in the eyes of the child on the right, you notice that the pupils are white. And that's because the lens that the child is born with uh, is, is an opaque lens. And in the, on the left, the corneas are opaque. Various kinds of retinal dystrophies, various kinds of infections, and even the congenital rubella syndrome, which refers to maternal infection by the rubella virus leading to the fetus uh, being born blind. So because there are still cases of maternal rubella in the country, we still have cases of congenital cataracts due to uh, maternal rubella. So given these kinds of causes, it turns out that a significant proportion of all childhood blindness in the country is either preventable or even treatable 
but many children for, the, for causes that you, might, you can easily imagine languish without treatment. Either their parents aren't aware that the child's condition is treatable or they're too far away from a, a surgical facility. So the child languishes without treatment and they lead difficult lives. They lead significantly shortened lives. Uh, there's very high childhood mortality amongst blind children. Very few of the blind children get uh, satisfactory education and very few of them are employed as adults. This defines the humanitarian mission that we are setting out to address. It's an obvious humanitarian mission. It's to identify, to find children like this boy who are blind because of a condition that we have all of the medical technology, all of the medical know-how to treat. We simply need to identify such children and provide them medical care. But in bringing medical care to such children, as neuroscientists, we have an incredible opportunity and truly an unprecedented opportunity to look at what the initial stages of visual learning and brain plasticity are. So the hope that we had in trying to understand what are the initial stages of this transformation from sensory chaos to an organized sens sensorium, we can actually address that hope with such a child. So if you have, say, a 10-year-old child who has not seen from birth, and you are able to transition him or her into sight in a matter of 30 minutes, then from the very moment that the bandages are opened, you have a ringside seat onto the process of visual learning. So it's almost this perfect synergy between a humanitarian mission and a scientific quest. And seeing this perfect synergy, about 20 years ago, we launched Project Prakash. Prakash, uh, the word captures the dual themes of our work, bringing light into the lives of blind children and also illuminating some of the deep questions of neuroscience. We have operationalized Project Prakash in this three-part manner. The most complex, logistically complex bit is outreach, finding such children. So our outreach teams, comprising optometrists, ophthalmologists, uh, primary healthcare workers, go far and wide into the Gangetic Plains, into Madhya Pradesh, into Rajasthan, to find children who are languishing without, uh, without medical care. Such children are brought to New Delhi, <coughs> where they're provided world-class ophthalmic surgeries. Uh, we have our medical partner is the Dr. Shroff Charity Eye Hospital, and it's just a wonderful private hospital in Darya Ganj. So they provide all of the surgeries, and following the surgeries, we have the opportunity to undertake scientific research with the goal of understanding how vision develops after the onset of sight. But even before we could get to the question of how vision develops, we had to seriously consider whether vision is going to develop at all in such children. So would the brain of a child who's say eight years old, or perhaps a young adult who's in his 20s, would their brains be sufficiently plastic to be able to change in response to the information that the eyes have begun to provide it? And no less significantly, would the behavior of the child benefit from however the brain is changing. So would the child be better able to make use of their visual information? The reason we had to ask these questions and the reason we were a little pessimistic about the possible answers is this very rich body of literature in neuroscience on the notion of critical periods in visual development. The idea that there's a small window early in development, perhaps lasting no more than the first two or three years, during which the brain requires, necessarily requires, normal visual input. And if it's denied visual input during that period, then forevermore, it'll be unable to, to do vision. David Hubel and Torsten Wiesel won the Nobel Prize in 1981 for their beautiful studies 
about the impact of visual deprivation on the brains of cats and monkeys. And I'll show you a quick vignette of the kind of results they found. So here's a, a normally sighted kitten. Immediately after birth, uh, Hubel and Wiesel would suture shut one eye. So now this kitten is experiencing the world only with one eye open. And it's monocular, monocularly deprived for about two months. After that, the sutured eye is opened, and now the kitten has two seemingly normal eyes. But its behavior suggests that it com it's completely blind in the eye that was shut for just two months. And if you then look at the brain, as Hubel and Wiesel did, what they found was something quite remarkable. So first, let's look at the brain of a non-deprived kitten. So what you're seeing here is the surface of the visual cortex, so the part of the brain that does the, the first stage of visual processing in the brain. And these stripes that you're seeing, the light and dark stripes, correspond to neurons in the visual cortex that are responding to either the left eye or the right eye. And what you notice is that the the thicknesses of the two kinds of stripes is about even. So they are roughly the same number of neurons devoted to the left as to the right eye. But now let's look at the brain of the kitten that has undergone this temporary deprivation in one eye. This is what you see. Most of the neurons in this kitten have been taken over by the open eye and the temporarily closed eye has lost its foothold in the brain perhaps explaining why this kitten is behaving as if it's completely blind in the temporarily closed eye. This result, um, well, uh, one additional aspect to this result is, no matter how long this kitten is now experiencing the world with both eyes open, this change that it has undergone in the brain is irreversible. And this is what led to the idea of critical periods that maybe the, sometime during the first two months, there's a critical window of development. If you extrapolate this idea to the human uh, uh, child, then that would mean that maybe the first couple of years, if it's a few months for the kitten, maybe it's a few years for humans. <clears throat> but there is a critical period, and if a child is left blind during those critical years, then forevermore, the child will be blind no matter what you do to surgically correct the blindness of the eye. That dogma has led some doctors to deny treatment to children who are older than, say, seven or eight years, because they believe that the risk of surgery does not, is not outweighed by the gains that the child is going to have after the surgery. But that extrapolation or that belief that past the first few years, there's no point in offering surgery to the child, has to be done with a lot of caution. Because the animal studies of the kind that we just saw have a very different model. They're looking at the effects of monocular deprivation, whereas many of the Prakash children, many of the children that we work with, have binocular deprivation. And the effects of these two kinds of deprivation may be quite different. And there are various other factors, but the bottom line is that fundamental questions about human brain plasticity still remain open. We cannot simply infer the answer to those questions from the animal studies. How do we get answers to those questions? Project Prakash has begun to provide some of those answers. So here are a couple of vignettes of uh, the findings that we are getting from Prakash. We have been very fortunate in having access to a neuroimaging facility in New Delhi. This is the Mahajan Neuroimaging Facility in South Delhi. We can bring the Prakash children to this facility and image their brains pre-operatively and then at various time points post-operatively. And what we find is something quite remarkable. In the brain of a 20-year-old person, what we see so this is seven days post-operative, this is a month post-operatively, and this is four months post-operatively. So even just at a glance, 
you can tell that something dramatic is going on. The brain is changing its functional activations. Which parts of the brain are active is undergoing changes over a matter of just a few months. And this is, as I said, the brain of a 20-year-old person. So even 20 years into the developmental timeline, the brain still maintains significant plasticity to rewire itself very quickly after the onset of sight. And without boring you with the details, even the kind of change that we are observing, it's a, a decorrelation of neural activity. That seems to make sense if we were to interpret the brain as an information encoding device. The brain seems to be becoming less redundant in its coding of visual information. I'll leave it at that, but the, the takeaway from this uh, collection of images is simply that the brain has a lot of plasticity even late in life. Here is another example. In this case, the 21-year-old subject is lying in the scanner and looking at images of faces and non-faces, and we are seeing which part of the brain responds more to facial images than to non-face images. And even just two days past surgery, there is a little hot spot in roughly the right location. And when I say right, it, what I mean is, if I were to take any one of you as participants and show you these same images, there would be a portion of your right hemisphere, roughly in the location that you see here, that would respond more to faces than to non-faces. So the brain of this Prakash individual is already coming to respond in the, in the normal way. And then as time progresses, this activation gets progressively stronger until by about a year out, you have a very strong activation that almost seems like a normal activation, attesting to plasticity of the brain uh, despite over two decades of deprivation. And the final result that I'll mention is something that we published a few months ago. Besides the activation changes in the brain, we are finding that the very structure of the brain, the anatomy of the brain, undergoes a transformation in a matter of just a few months after the onset of sight. So based on these kinds of results, and we have several more in the pipeline, the answer to the first question that we posed, is the brain malleable enough to make use of information from the eyes late in life? The answer seems to be an affirmative one. How about the second question? Does the child actually benefit from how, howsoever the brain is changing. And there, let me show you a video uh, of a child. So this is Gaurav, and you notice preoperatively how dense his cataracts are. Uh, you're going to see him preoperatively and then postoperatively. And we've asked him to find the box of chocolates that you see on the side of the hospital corridor. So preoperatively, of course, it's a kind of a cruel thing to ask of a child who can see no more than light and dark. And you notice his shuffling gait and the difficulty that he has in finding it. And this is about a week after surgery. That was Gaurav, and here is one more child. Oh, <laughs> thank you. <coughs> one more short little clip. So this is Sarika, uh, and uh, what you're going to see is Sarika post-op. Uh, we don't have a video clip of Sarika pre-op, uh, but here is her post-op. So the boy who Sarika is playing with is also a Prakash uh, patient 
who was treated about five years before this video was made. So this was filmed on the last day of Sarika being in the hospital. Um, so she's going home with some gifts that the Prakash team had given her. And she's in the room to get her eyeglasses. <laughs> so those, they're heartwarming little anecdotes. But as scientists, we also need to be very rigorous about determining what kinds of recovery are these children showing on a variety of dimensions of visual function. Some of these dimensions can be very low level, things like how clear are the images, uh, how well can the children see moving objects, how, how strong does the contrast need to be before they, they can see something. But some of these dimensions are also high level dimensions, things like how well can they recognize things, how well can they recognize people, can they imagine visual structures in their, in their mind? And based on all of these data that the team has been collecting over the past several years, the answer to the second question, can a child who has been blind for several years benefit from optical correction of the eye? The answer we feel is quite unambiguously an, uh, an affirmative one. These children do in fact benefit significantly. I want to just briefly dwell on one of these results because it touches on a really old problem, uh, a problem that's rich in history. Uh, this is a problem of cross-modal mapping, and I'll just mention what this problem is. So the problem is so famous that it even has a name. It's called Molyneux's query. It was posed over 300 years ago by a philosopher in England, and the problem is this. How do we predict the visual appearance of an object based on how it feels to the touch? I can feel an object like this in total darkness and then have no trouble whatsoever when the lights are turned on to say which was the object I'd, I'd been feeling. There seems to be a mapping between the shape perception that I'm getting with my hands and the shape perception that I'm getting with my eyes. The question that Molly New posed is whether this mapping is something that we are born with or is it something that we have to learn? And as I'm sure all of you can, uh, can intuit, this is connected to the famous nature-nurture debate. How much of our proficiencies are inborn and how much, uh, which ones are learned? About Molyneux's problem, this is what the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy has to say. There is no problem in the history of the philosophy of perception that has provoked more thought than the problem that Molyneux raised in 1688. So this problem had stayed open. It had vexed philosophers and neuroscientists. Project Prakash, for the first time, offered an answer to this, to this question. Um, because these are exactly the, the profile of children that you would want in order to ask this question. So with a very simple experiment, we were able to get the answer. And the answer, if you're curious, is that at the outset, there is no mapping between touch and vision. There's no innate dispensation. We have to learn that mapping through experience. So we have to experience the world through both our visual modality and our tactile modality, and the brain systematically learns that mapping. So it was a really beautiful, beautiful for us and also beautiful for the field at large, beautiful conclusion to a question that had stayed open for such a long time, uh, that finally children who had gained sight were able to provide a satisfactory answer. And this conclusion of, this, of Molyneux's query uh, was reported in many outlets, both scientific and uh, popular, like the New York Times. Let me turn to some of the broader impact that Project Prakash has had. So we have certainly gotten many, many insights into the development of the Prakash children. We've understood to a significant uh, level what early visual deprivation does or does not do 
to later uh, visual function. <clears throat> but there are also results and insights that go beyond Project Prakash, and that's what I want to briefly mention, so the broader impact of Project Prakash. One really unusual and unexpected outcome of Project Prakash has been the formulation of a theory of autism. I would never have expected that congenitally blind children would have anything to say about what's affected uh, in the brain in, in autism. But indeed, this, this turns out to be an insight to be had. And we have formulated that hypothesis. And that hypothesis has now turned out to be extremely influential, both for our experimental work, understanding autism, and also for the work in many other labs. So that's one aspect of the broader impact Project Prakash has had. Another line of work from Prakash <clears throat> that is gradually becoming more and more mature is a theory of development and also a strategy for training artificial intelligence systems. So as we understand what the strengths and limitations of the Prakash children are, we are understanding why normal development that many of us have undergone, why that proceeds in the particular way that it does. What are the reasons, the adaptive reasons, for the specific choreography that all of us experience? And by extension, what might be the benefits of imposing that choreography on AI systems? So if we were to have machine vision systems or artificial intelligence systems go through the same kinds of developmental stages, might there be benefits uh, more than just the conventional training strategies for AI systems. And in fact, we find that that's the case. So we have described uh, this partial theory of development. And most ambitiously, <clears throat> and this is still work in progress, Project Prakash has begun to give us some foundational insights into what are the basic principles that underlie this transformation that we started out our, our uh, discussion with. The transformation from a sensory chaos to an organized sensorium. So we are starting out on formulating a, a theory of overall brain function based on the results that we're getting from Project Prakash. So Project Prakash in the two decades of its existence has proven to be just a remarkably satisfying enterprise for all of us on the team. It has given us insights regarding brain plasticity and learning, some of which that I've sh shown you vignettes of. It has given us some clinically relevant hypotheses about conditions like autism. It has begun to guide our thinking about how we might make more effective AI systems that are as robust as the human perceptual system. It has helped in some modest way towards alleviating the challenge of childhood blindness in India. And it has also begun to serve as the model of an alternative paradigm. And by that I mean the, the dissociation that many of us have, that there's something about lab research and that's quite different from social service, that you can do social service in your off hours, but in your professional life, you are a scientist doing fundamental research. But Project Prakash suggests that there might be opportunities where you can intermesh these two sides of your hopes and your goals of bringing succor to society and also making advances in fundamental science. You can bring them together seamlessly and in progressing along one axis, you also progress along the other axis. This work has been very warmly received by the scientific community. Uh, we've been featured prominently in journals like Science and Nature, but also in more popular outlets, places like the Boston Globe and Time Magazine. And we find that appearance in these kinds of, of destinations like Time and the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal, that's really crucial if we are to have any hope of having these results 
make their way towards policy. Most satisfying of all, of course, are the stories of the children that we have been privileged to see unfold in front of us and the changes that come into them after the onset of sight. So here is a, a Prakash child learning to ride a bicycle a year after his surgery. And when he had come to the hospital for the very first time, he needed somebody to even help him cross the road. But now he is much more independent. Here are a few Prakash children who are expressing their creative talents. We run a session called Unruly Art every time that we are in India. We devote a day to art activities. And this is one of the, the paintings that resulted from that. This painting now hangs in my office at MIT. We had an exhibition of some of the unruly art paintings uh, at Princeton University a few years ago. And here are the paintings that emerged from the latest unruly art session just about five days ago. <coughs> So far, we have treated 520 blind children, uh, provided non-surgical care to several more, uh, about 2,000 of them. And in order to be able to do that, we had to provide ophthalmic screening to over 60,000 children. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah. One of the realizations that we've had in pursuing this work and following up on the unfolding trajectories of these children is that it's not sufficient just to provide them medical care. We also need to provide them some initial steps into education. Because most of these children, because of their blindness, they have been left untouched by education. Even if they have gone and sat in the, in the local school, they've not really imbibed much knowledge. So for them to now begin making their way towards the educational mainstream, they need some scaffolding program to get them to an age-appropriate level after which they can be mainstreamed. And we have started a very small residential educational program uh, in Delhi for that purpose. This also explains the incorporation of education in the ambit of our work, also explains the, the logo that we have, the three petals of this little flower bird correspond to medical care, scientific research, and education. <clears throat> Even as we take pride and satisfaction in these uh, stories and in these accomplishments, we have to acknowledge that we, ha we have really just begun the journey. So if you consider this little green dot to represent all of the children that we have treated so far. The actual scale of the problem in, in our country is this. So we have a long ways to go before we can say that Project Prakash has really had significant impact on, uh, on the problem in the country. And India is not unique in facing this problem. Much of the global south has this issue. Um, in fact, some countries even more acutely than India, especially in, in Africa. So one of our hopes in the years to come is to expand the footprint of Project Prakash into multiple nations. We call this dream, that's what it is at the moment, we call this dream Global Prakash, to have a network of Prakash sites across many different countries that can collaborate, share knowledge, and make sure that children all over the world uh, are never deprived of the treatment that they need. Each one of these sites and the, the network collectively would have the same kind of mission to provide medical outreach, to then provide treatment, to follow that up with education and rehabilitation, and to have an undercurrent of basic scientific research that can not only further our understanding of the brain, but also feed back into the treatment itself and improve the outcomes from the treatment. All of this sounds extremely ambitious. It's very appealing to, to think about this, 
but it's also overwhelmingly intimidating. But whenever one is faced with such overwhelming odds against one's success, it's good to remember <clears throat> the immortal words of Albert Einstein, who said, those who have the privilege to know have the duty to act. So if we know that this problem exists in the world, and we even know what the broad outlines of the solution can be, then it becomes a moral obligation to do something about it. We have been extremely privileged to be part of communities like IIT and to be part of communities like MIT and Harvard and Berkeley. We have to make use of that privilege in order to advance along these, uh, these goals. It's in that spirit that the entire team of Project Prakash keeps moving forward. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Of course. Any questions? So we'll take a few questions. Uh, my request to each one of you would be to keep your questions succinct. So first of all, thank you very much for that wonderful talk and all the work that you've done. It's such a pleasure to see someone who's gone to the West from here contributing back to the country in a tangible way. So hats off to you for that. Thank you. Uh, sir, regarding that statistic that you had once said that 40% uh, of the children who are suffering from mm -hmm. this can be cured, can anything be done for the other 60%? Uh, you mentioned AI and uh, we've seen ad advances in Neuralink sort of uh, consumer devices which can directly plug into neurons. Do you think there is some hope for it, maybe sometime in the future for that 60% also to have yes. to regain their blindness? <coughs> Just a small second part, sir. How can we contribute to Project Prakash? Oh, uh, thank you. Uh, so for the first part, uh, what can be done about children who are currently not curable by even the latest medical technology? So I would say, uh, not to sound too pessimistic, but the current uh, technologies on the anvil, things like neural link, or things like retinal prostheses, I don't think they are going to come to fruition at least for the next 10 or so years. Uh, the idea of retinal prostheses has been around for over 20 years, and quite remarkably, hardly any progress has been made there. The challenges are just too difficult. Similarly with Neuralink, we would need to solve some very uh, difficult neuroscience problems, one of them being what is the language of the neurons? So when you're stimulating particular sets of neurons, what does it mean to stimulate, to convey particular information to a particular set of neurons? We don't know that. And unless we know that, we would not succeed at creating a, a, a useful neural link device. So I would say that for the moment, uh, we should at least reach out to the children who are curable. And for the rest of the children, even as we keep working on things like neural link and retinal prostheses, we have to provide them with the very best rehabilitative care. Uh, Professor PVM Rao is sitting right here. Uh, his lab does amazing work on coming up with technologies that can prove assistive for people with profound visual impairment. So we ought to make sure that children who can benefit from medical care are provided that, and those who can benefit from assistive technology are provided that. A lot of the children at the moment don't get either, either one of these two. In terms of how uh, to, uh, to contribute to this effort, there are many different ways. Uh, we benefit from advice. There are many challenges on the ground uh, too numerous for me to list here, but I'm happy to, to get your contact information and, and convey to you some of the ways in which we would love to, to work together or get your help. Yeah. Any other question? Uh, good morning, sir. Sir, uh, 
post-operative, has there been uh, uh, any change in any kind of a cognitive behavior of the children or has there been any monitoring with respect to that? Because visual perception forms a basic <coughs> foundation for how we cognitively uh, you know, grasp or take yeah. hold of things. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, and I would fully expect that there would be significant improvements in the cognitive styles of the, of the Prakash children. We have not regrettably followed that systematically. But just anecdotally, that seems to be very true. In fact, in the latest group of children, we had a little boy, I think seven or eight years old, who prior to surgery was very withdrawn, very shy. The, uh, we weren't even sure whether uh, he is neurologically entirely normal. After surgery, it was like a miracle had happened, and he was the most uh, rambunctious, uh, the most lively little boy. So those kinds of things uh, completely changing the overt cognitive behavior of the child, I think if we were to study it systematically, would reveal a very significant impact of, of surgery. So I'm from medical background. Mm. I come from AIMS, and we've been reading all this physiology, <laughs> uh, neurophysiology. The best thing you have told us today, like when we learned in 81 about vision, it was sold after the development, no neuroplasticity mm. in adulthood. And there was a big article on, on uh, MIT reviews. In fact, I've been reading those, and also uh, uh, National Geographic, that how uh, the brain's child after puberty can change. So the plasticity coming later in life is a big evidence which you have. So I'm really commendable the work which you have done. showed that even an after adult, the brain plasticity comes up. That was a question for almost 50, 60 years people mm -hmm. have thought of. The other question I'm thinking today, so when the chaos is coming, the, does the brain has a tool to classify the information? It appears the, pla the, the postal parietal co cortex, which is five times bigger than visual mm -hmm. cortex, has those tools to classify any information which is coming. It could be auditory, visual, or sensory, and they, that's where this cross modality takes place. Hmm. So it appears the brain has some innate classifiers which can take, and that's why these children now, uh, on depending on those classifiers available, and then they try to make sense. Otherwise, if the visual cortex is independent, it can't do that job unless you go to postal parietal cortex. Yes, so uh, that's thank a, you. Thank you. Uh, that's a very important point. So in terms of the the gradient of plasticity that we're observing, there are some limitations in the plasticity of the primary visual cortex, the first stage of visual processing. But then as you move to later areas, uh, the extra striate cortex, we find even more significant plasticity there. And uh, your suggestion is, I think, exactly on point, that those later areas are probably playing the major role in terms of acting as classifiers. So whatever information is being provided to those areas from the primary sensory cortices, whether the visual cortex or the auditory cortex or the somatosensory cortex, it's being brought together for classification purposes by the, by the later cortices. And that ability seems to be impact, intact in the Prakash children. Yes. All right, perhaps we'll take a couple of more questions, and um, after that, we can conclude the session. I, I, I would invite each one of you to come out for refreshments and um, uh, seek his time and perhaps interact with him so, with more so, questions. Sorry. So, so the major achievement from your study, in practical terms, seems to be that uh, uh, there is, in fact, meaning. The surgery even at a later age, like 20, is meaningful. I'm just curious, since I have some uh, visually impaired uh, uh, friends of my own age as well, uh, how far will you go, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> for a good deal older people? Great question. So I don't think there's an upper bound. Uh, the oldest that we have worked with is 29. 
but I don't think that defines the upper upper limit. I believe that if we were to work with significantly older individuals, we would continue to find evidence of plasticity. In fact, this is an anecdotal result, not from our lab, but from a colleague. He was 85 years old. He had a severely amblyopic eye. Uh, so amblyopia is a condition that's colloquially referred to as lazy eye. The eye looks normal uh, externally, but the person has difficulty seeing clearly from that eye. And we don't know what the causes of amblyopia are. Uh, but past the age of seven or eight, amblyopia is very difficult to, to cure. So this 85-year-old had one good eye and one amblyopic eye. And then due to some accident, he lost the good eye. Amazingly enough, at the age of 85, the amblyopic eye, because it was now being called upon to shoulder all of the burden of vision, his vision improved from the amblyopic eye. And I don't take this report lightly because this is a neuroscientist who is telling me this, and he got his acuity measured. So the fact that even at the age of 85, you can have a change in the brain uh, to respond to this kind of uh, a change in vision, it just suggests that we have amazing stores of plasticity in our, in our brains. <laughs> okay, one last question. Um, thanks for the wonderful talk. <laughs> so I'm a faculty in computer science department and uh, work in computer vision. Uh, so what uh, we have studied in the vision is that, so this Hubble and Wiesel thing that you want talked about. So we understand there is a certain age pattern and that's how uh, the human, I mean, I think the experiments were done on the animals, but that's how we thought that the human vision is working. And the vision algorithms were also developed in that way. I mean, in fact, the AI thing that you're mentioning. So there was some of the early results where they showed that the edge pattern is also emerging in the neural networks. Now, with this project, Prakash, and the experiment that you're doing, is there any such fundamental uh, understanding what the vision, that how we are really seeing? Are we still looking at the edge, or we are looking some global and then local Anything of that kind? Any yeah, so insights? that's a great question, and I would love to uh, to answer that at length. But let me let me point you to this paper because uh, sorry, this one. So th this one has a mix of uh, some experimental observations and also simulations with deep networks to look at what kinds of receptive fields emerge in the initial convolutional layers. Um, they are, I mean, to, to give you the short version of the story, they look like Gabor filters, so kind of like bar and edge filters, but the sizes of those filters uh, is dependent on the kind of experiential history that the, the, the network has gone through. If the network goes through a quote-unquote normal visual development, then the receptive fields that emerge are different looking than the receptive fields that emerge from the conventional style of training in machine vision. And it's not just the appearance of the receptive fields that's different, but even the performance of the network is different. And the network performs better if it's trained in the developmentally biomimetic manner than if it's trained in the conventional machine learning manner. So uh, take a look at this paper. Uh, it, I think you might find some, yeah. Uh, let's thank uh, one last time, Professor Sina, for such a wonderfully <laughs> thank you. inspiring and informative talk. Thank you. Uh, and I invite Professor Rangar Banerjee to give a token of our appreciation to Professor Sina. Thank you again. This was just such an amazingly uh, impactful session for me. I mean, to come home and to have this kind of a reception, it means the world to me. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Ambuj. Thank you, Professor Narayanan. Thank you, Professor Rangan. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Professor Singh. I invite uh, each one of you outside to have refreshments, and perhaps you'll get some more minutes to <laughs>
uh, ask questions to Professor Sena. Yeah.